All right, let's start over. So the language and dialect distinction is a little bit different from um, what we talked about with respect to accent on last Tuesday. So when you talk about language and dialect, you're often talking about distinctions in um, the grammar, in the lexicon, in the syntax, in the semantic content, and not just the pronunciation. But very often people actually think that the distinction between language and dialect is one that linguists actually talk about, right? Or social linguists actually talk about. But the truth is so far from it, linguists actually have nothing to do with the language and dialect distinction. It's often based on sociopolitical um, reasonings. So here I have some examples of, uh, you know, languages such as English and Chinese and Hindi, uh, you know, you're, you're more than familiar with English, so we will talk a little bit more about Chinese and Hindi, um, uh, you know, and how uh, the distinction between languages and dialects within these languages is simply on the basis of sociopolitical um, grounds. So let's look at Chinese. So very often, you know, some of you may have taken a class in Mandarin Chinese, or, you know, you might have seen the term Mandarin Chinese, right? Um, very often that refers to the standard version of Chinese spoken in mainland uh, China. But, you know, China is such a huge country. I mean, it's the largest population in the world. There are so many different um, countries that speak Chinese, such as Taiwan and Hong Kong and, you know, surrounding um, other surrounding countries surrounding uh, China. And there are different varieties of Chinese. So Cantonese Chinese, Taiwanese Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, Hakka, Hokkien. Um, it, these different varieties of Chinese are actually not mutually intelligible with each other. Mutually intelligible is a term that we often use in linguistics. It means that if there are two varieties of a language and you understand each other, then the two varieties are mutually intelligible with each other. Now, my variety of English is not the American English variety because I didn't grow up here, but it's mutually intelligible with your variety of English, right? Which is why you can understand pretty much what I say. Um, even though it's not the same as your variety of English, mutually intelligible, right? But with the Chinese cases, with Cantonese and Taiwanese and Mandarin Chinese and all the other dialects, they are not mutually intelligible. So if I am a speaker of Cantonese, it doesn't mean that I know Mandarin Chinese, or if I speak to a person who only speaks Mandarin Chinese, they cannot understand me, right? It's like speaking two different languages. But they use the same script, right? And you know, very often uh, the, the written script is a uniting factor in a in a lot of different ways. But the the case of Chinese is interesting because it's the government that actually they don't want to recognize these different varieties. It's different languages. They actually want to unify China. They actually want to unify all these different countries speaking Chinese. And so they only want to have one variety of or one language, so to say, right? So very often Cantonese and Taiwanese and Hokkien and Hakka and all these different varieties are treated to be dialects, even though they should individually be recognized as languages, but that doesn't happen, okay? But again, it's for sociopolitical reasons, not because of linguistic reasons. So, um, they, you know, the, the national official variety of the Chinese people is known as Mandarin, right, which is why very often in um, universities or, you know, if you happen to have a Mandarin Chinese class in school, it was called Mandarin or Mandarin Chinese, right? Um, it's very difficult for you to learn the Cantonese uh, dialect or the Hakka dialect because people don't recognize them as different languages. So it's very difficult to, you know, see a class in particularly in Cantonese or Taiwanese or Hakka at the university level or, you know, in a school district. Um, but it actually goes back to the fact that, you know, the, the Chinese government wanted to have a united language to kind of unify the people. So sociopolitical factors. So let me talk you talk to you briefly about Hindu Hindi uh, Urdu, which was the other language that I had. So Hindi Urdu is the official language of India, and uh, like I said, India has 
you know, we don't know how many languages uh, are spoken in India, but we think roughly about 1,500, 1,600 languages or so. Very often there is a sentiment among the Indian people that Hindi Urdu is a national language. Like you will very often hear this in Hindi Urdu, it says Hindi Hamari Rashtriya Bhasha Hai, which means Hindi is our national language in Hindi Urdu. That's not true. It's complete misinformation, okay? Hindi has an official language status, but not a national language status. India does not have a national language just like United States does not have a national language, right? We have official languages in the United States. Oh, English is the de facto official language of the United States, but it's not in the constitution, right? Your constitution doesn't say that English is your national language, even though, again, there's a, there's a sentiment that, you know, English is the unifying language and English is the national language. Again, part of misinformation, right? Sociopolitical reasons. So Hindi Urdu has the same kind of status back in India, right? Uh, the government has this kind of, you know, sentiment out there that it's a unifying language. It's the language that every Indian should speak. But the truth is that Hindi Urdu is many different languages mutually unintelligible with each other that are conglomerated into this one language. So there are different, they call it dialects, but they are actually different languages. Uh, like Bundeli, Magahi, Angika, Maithili. My name is actually a language in India, um, but it's pronounced Maithili and not Maithili uh, because it's a North Indian pronunciation. Uh, and I'm from South India. There's a there's a whole lot of sociopolitical things that I just you know kind of mixed into that statement, but I don't want to get into that. Um, but all these different dialects are not treated as languages. They're treated as dialects because the government really wants to drive home the point that you need to speak Hindi Urdu, you need to learn Hindi Urdu, Hindi Urdu needs to be taught at the you know the school level, at the elementary school level, middle school level, because it's the uniting language. Right? But again, socio-political reasons, not because of any linguistic reason. The distinction between language and dialect is completely arbitrary. It's kind of like you know to go Back, circle all the way back to one of our earlier lectures in Linguistics 151, where we talked about how the symbolic nature of the sign means that the form of the sign and the meaning is completely arbitrary, right? I mean, we could have called the dog perro in Spanish and, you know, whatever the term in Amharic was, but it's completely arbitrary, right? That, that kind of form and meaning uh, association. It's the same thing with language and dialect. The distinction of who decides what a language is and a dialect is completely arbitrary. And it has to do with power, power politics quite a bit. So um, depending on who's in power at what point in time, that particular variety of English becomes or English or whatever that language is becomes standard language. So very often in, in United States, if you look at the history, uh, it's one variety of English that became promoted to the standard variety, right? I mean, if history was rewritten and suppose, you know, um, the, the history of African-Americans were very different, suppose, maybe we would all be speaking, I ain't doing nothing, right? With all our double negatives and, you know, the African-American vernacular English variety, but but that's that was not the power, powerful group if you look at history. So there's a lot of social, political and historical reasons for the distinction between language and um, dialect. And there was a philosopher called Max Weinreich, um, a German philosopher who said, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. And the, the meaning of this is that any language that has power is a language. If it does not have power, that language becomes a dialect. Right. So that, that's really, you know, the way to think about language and dialect, um, you know, the same way that we want to think about any other power system, right, and systemic kind of inequalities that exist in today's world, languages are no different. Right. Um, so, you know, there are standalone classes where we can talk a lot more about this, especially when we get into the sociolinguistic aspect of it. But, you know, that's, that's the thought I'm gonna leave you with for that. So let's get a little bit more into dialects so you can have different varieties of language. Uh, 
depending on, you know, many different factors. Geographical location is a great factor for, you know, classifying languages into dialect. So you have English and then you have Scots English, Irish English, Southern US English, Hong Kong English, Cockney, et cetera, which are different dialects of English. And very often you can actually distinguish dialects into two different kinds. You can have social dialects and you can have ethnic uh, dialects. What do I mean by social dialects? Very often, um, you know, it, it's, it's not just geographical location, but according to different social classes and different religious and ethnic groups. Uh, so the example that I have here is about Arabic. So very often when we hear Arabic, we think it's only the Muslims who speak Arabic, uh, but Muslims are only one religious group that speaks Arabic. There are also Christian uh, Arabs and Jewish Arabs, and depending on your religious affinity, your Arabic dialect actually changes, right? So, you know, um, I had an undergraduate student of mine a couple of years ago um, in English education who actually did a paper. Uh, it was a final paper of history of English, but then she, she did such a good job that she presented it at a, uh, at a linguistic conference and we actually got a published paper out of that, uh, me and her together. Um, and one of the things that she looked at was this distinction between uh, the, the religious Arabic spoken in Palestine. She, she uh, is actually from Palestine or her ancestry is from Palestine. Um, and you know, she was looking at the effects of migration on the Arabic. So her family moved from Palestine to Syria, to Kuwait, to America. And her father was actually the first one to come to America. And he was a student at Wichita State, like back in the 1980s or something like that. Um, so, you know, it, she was tracing how her Arabic is just so different because she was born here and brought up here um, versus her dad's Arabic and her grandmother's Arabic, um, depending again, they, they were Muslims, but you know, um, again, that influence between Christian and Muslim and Jewish kind of variety with geographical location. So, you know, I know some of you are in history of English, so if you're still looking for projects to do, you know, um, you can look, literally do what you feel like doing within that, you know, history of English parameter that I've given you. Um, the other kinds of dialect is ethnic dialect, which is, you know, um, something that you're more familiar with, like the African American vernacular English, uh, for example, it's an ethnic dialect and not a social dialect because you can't really isolate different geographical locations within America where Ave is spoken, but you can definitely, you know, identify a, a, a particular ethnic community or an ethnic group that actually speaks that dialect. Okay, so social dialects and ethnic uh, dialects. Now, you know, from my uh, discussion in today's lecture about dialects, you must be thinking that the, the history of dialectology, the study of dialects is actually quite old. It's not. Dialectology is a very new field, right? I mean, it, it only began in the 19th century. So, you know, uh, we're only talking about 100 and 150 years of, you know, I mean, it's as old as Wichita State, uh, you know, dialectology, so that's not too old at all. Um, but the American Dialect Society, which was the first society to talk about dialects of English, was founded in 1889, and that's really what spurred the discussions of dialects. Uh, until then, people always cared about that standard dialect and standard English or standard language, which comes from the British, thank you, and colonization. Um, but, but it was around that time when the American Dialect Society was created that, you know, people really started caring about the different uh, pronunciations and dialects and all that. Two of the things that the American Dialect Society uh, conducted, two studies that they conducted, one was a linguistic atlas of New England. Um, again, you know, big, big compendiums of, um, you know, uh, maps and data and all that that was collected uh, across a period of time. And the second atlas that they made was a linguistic atlas of the Middle and South Atlantic states uh, called as LAMSAS. So this really spurred the beginning of dialectology. And, you know, the data and the methodology for these atlases uh, were quite varied. There were questionnaires and extensive surveys that people would actually, you know, go from place to place and hand it out like pen and paper because, hey, we're not talking about a 
we're not talking about today where you can just, you know, type everything up and send everything up through email or, you know, have a QR code or something like that. But in those days, people actually had to take a pen and paper with a questionnaire and like, you know, gather the data. Um, they would go on field trips and do all this field work to get this data, as well as, uh, you know, do audio recordings and do transcription of the audio recording. So different kinds of methodology for the data. And the biggest work conducted by the American Dialect Society is called as DARE. It's a Dictionary of American Regional English. Um, and this was based on face-to-face -face interviews carried out in all 50 states between 1965 and 1970. It is to this date, the biggest work ever undertaken um, in dialectology. Uh, you can, you know, um, search for DARE and you will see the website. They have a website with, you know, um, all the information. Um, you can see the maps that they've collected. You can see all the, you know, the written material that they've collected um, across a period of five years. And, you know, I believe that they have run out of funding. So I don't think that they're doing any new work, but, you know, all the work that has been carried out before is open access and I think available uh, for you to see. So, I highly recommend um, taking a look at the DARE's uh, website. So when you look at the website for DARE um, or you know, the, the, the volumes that they have created, you can begin to see these kind of maps emerging. These maps are called as you know, linguistic atlas maps or language dialect um, maps. So this is the state of Wisconsin. And this is from the 1965-1970 DARE uh, survey. And this is the question, what did Wisconsinites call their fizzy soft drinks 50 years ago? Okay, so 50 years before 1965, remember? Okay, uh, so what do you think? Did they call, call uh, their fizzy drink pop or soda? I believe it was soda. Yeah, uh, I mean, there is soda too, Kelly, but uh, can you see the... the uh, oh, okay, gotcha. Uh -huh. Mostly yeah. pop. Mostly pop. pop. Right, pop. So there are some cities or towns that, ha you know, have majority soda, and there are some cities which are purple in color that are both pop and soda, but majority of the cities are all pop, right? What would you call soda or pop? What, what, what do you call your fizzy soft drink in the Midwest? If you pop. want to put it in chat, yeah, or unmute pop, okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody who says soda? I say, I say soda. soda. I say soda. Okay, so you see the- so like the depends on the context, I guess. Like if I'm talking about like buying something like buying pop or like if I'm talking about, oh, I, you know, somebody like gives their kid too much pop, but if it's like a soda machine or like getting a soda at a restaurant. So I guess I use it in like different context, maybe, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you, I've never heard of a pop machine. Do you, do you call a soda machine a pop machine at all? No, like a, I call that a soda machine. And like, if you're getting like if you're going to order a soda like a pepsi or a coke at like the restaurant um but it's like different like outside of the restaurant i guess okay. where i'm like pop instead uh -huh. and i've always called it a pop machine oh you have yes oh and, and I, gr I grew up in this particular area and everyone i've ever heard refer to it they've said a pop machine so how do you distinguish a pop from a popsicle, is that the same term or? It's just by the name, yeah. I mean, popsicle and pop have different names. Okay, so you, th there's no ambiguity there. Like you, you know when you're talking about pop, it's a fizzy soft drink? Yes. Cool. Okay, wow, that's uh, okay. Yeah, I've not heard about the pop machine before. I mean, in past versions that I've taught this class, I think everybody called it a soda machine, but you know, yeah. And, and other people in the, in, yeah, Olivia, you want to say something? Um, I worked at a restaurant for a long time, and I also noticed people would sometimes say fizzy drink. Like, that's kind of, I don't know if that's like, oh, it's going to be a new thing, or it's just what certain people say. Um, but, like, if some, 
like I was thinking, oh, do I say pop machine or soda machine? And it's just kind of however people reference it to me first, then I'll say like, oh, the pop machine's over there or the soda machine's over there. So sure. kind of ambiguous, but fizzy drink was interesting to me. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, it, so if they say that they want a fizzy drink, then do you give them the option of, oh, we have Diet Coke and Sprite and, you know, let, is, is that what you would do? Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, so this is a map, like I said, 50 years before 1965 and 1970, right? Majority of them said pop. Now, this is a newer survey. This is the online survey of Wisconsin English done in 2013-2014. So a couple of years, uh, you know, five, six years ago. What do Wisconsinites call their fizzy soft drinks today? They call it soda. <laughs> yes. Soda. But isn't that incredible that within 50 years, a majority pop state went from pop to soda. We are talking about language change as it happens today, right? And these kind of maps and these kind of surveys are really useful to kind of drive home the point that language is not static and it's changing today as we speak. It's like how Olivia said, right? That maybe fizzy drink is something that's happening like right now, like, you know, the younger generation, maybe that's what they like and not pop or soda because of whatever reasons, right? It could be pop culture. It could be a viral TikTok video, right? That, that says, no, you should call your fizzy soft drink fizzy drink or something like that, right? So th this, uh, you know, it, it's always incredible to me how, we, again, there are limitations to the study, right? Don't get me wrong, right? I mean, it's a majority study, but not everybody was surveyed. So, you know, maybe if we got everybody in Wisconsin to say whether they call their fizzy soft drink pop or soda, we might end up with a different map, right? So keep that in mind, right? But obviously this is the majority uh, of the people that were surveyed. Uh, here is another one. What nicknames did Wisconsinites give their beer 50 years ago from the 1965-1970 uh, survey? What's the majority? What did they call their beer 50 years ago? It looks like brew, maybe. So brew is the red dot and the blue dot is the suds. So one. It looks pretty even. Let, let's, let's do a head count. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Seven blue dots. And one, two, three, four, five. Right, so SUDS is actually winning in the 1965-1970 uh, survey. Is that something that you would call your beer SUDS? Nope, okay. Do you call your beer brew at all? What do you call your beer? I don't drink beer. <laughs> okay, this is a question to people who are above 21 in this class. <laughs> I've always called it beer. beer. Yeah, I don't drink beer, but I call it beer, and everyone I know that does drink beer calls it beer. Yeah, I would just right? call it beer. Or they say, like, oh, I went and got, like, a craft brew or something, but, like, that's the only time that I hear anything other than beer, really. Okay, cool. Anybody who says cold one or cold thing or nope? Uh, okay, yeah, I'm going to go crack a cold one. That is something that, yeah, people say you know, that means beer, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's more, like, like you use it within that phrase, like crack open a cold one. Right, right, right. But you're not gonna, if you're at a restaurant, would you say, give me a cold one? Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> what do you think is gonna happen in the next map that I show you in the 2013-2014 survey? What's your prediction? Do you think they're still gonna say suds or do you think it's gonna change or? It, it might be more think, of a, it might be more brew than suds now. Okay, that's Kelly's prediction. Okay, let's test that prediction. Niall, I think you wanted to say something too. Uh, never mind. Okay, anybody else? Any other prediction? 
All right, let's test this prediction. So Kelly says that it might be more red dots now than blue dots, all right? Prediction wins, right? Um, in the 2013-2014 online survey of Wisconsin English, many more cities and towns uh, say brew now and not suds. That's literally only two towns that actually uh, you know, use suds and one town that actually uses both, the South Milwaukee. Olivia, did you have some a comment? Yeah, it looks like in that like Northeast region, there weren't any dots anymore. So I wonder if they just didn't participate or yeah, but maybe they all say suds over there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's why I always tell people when they see maps like this, be cautious that, you know, again, the, the, it, it depends on the methodology. It depends on who was surveyed. It depends on how many people did the survey, right? Given all that, we don't know all that just by looking at this map, that's a perfectly good question to ask, okay? So, uh, yeah. So, given what we know from the 2013-2014 survey, it looks like more towns, say, brew, at least the ones who participated in the survey, right? Or who they asked, so, yeah. All right, so I have a video here for the different, you know, kind of terminology uh, for the dialects, but I'm not gonna, sh in the interest of time, we are not gonna um, view this video right now, but I'm just gonna put that in the chat so that um, you can view it later. And it's, okay, so, so we, we looked at DARE, the, the uh, Dictionary of Regional American English, another project uh, that uh, happened in dialectology with the American Dialect Society is called as a telephone survey project, and this should be William Labov and not Labor, so it's L-A-B-O-V, let me make that change, perfect, okay. So the telephone survey project was called as TELSAR, and William Labov is literally the father of sociolinguistics, right? He uh, was a linguist in uh, Pennsylvania, and he is the founding father of sociolinguistics, so the field of sociolinguistics. So very often people refer to his um, studies quite a bit because they are fundamental in creating, um, you know, the field of sociolinguistics. So what he did was he actually would randomly call people through the telephone and just collect pronunciation data. And again, you would think that what a bizarre thing to do, right? Because I mean, I never pick up phone calls from people I don't know or numbers I don't know. But in those days, remember, these were all landlines, not mobile phones, right? So if your landline rung, you would be, you would pick up the phone because otherwise it would just keep on ringing and ringing and ringing and annoying, right? So. He did this and he, you know, he created a, a, a database, um, which he called as TELSER. So that was also one of the methodologies that he used. So this is one of the um, kind of, you know, results of uh, that kind of methodology where calling people on the phone. This is the distinction between caught and caught. As you can see, I do not have that distinction, neither do most of you. So this is a map. Uh, again, the red dot is when cot and cot have the same wall, it's merged. And the blue dot is when you have it distinctly. So if you look at Kansas right here, all red dots, right? All merged, no blue dots, right? Um, Oklahoma is all red, uh, Nebraska is all red. But look at this, right next to us, Missouri, blue. Right. Maybe Kansas City is red, but other parts of Missouri, blue, right? Um, Illinois, Wisconsin, right? All the, the Great Lakes uh, area, all blue. New York, New Jersey, that entire Washington, D.C. area, blue. And southern uh, states as well, all blue, except for Florida right here. And does North Carolina or South Carolina? South Carolina, this red dot? Maybe you guys know. Yeah, I believe that's South Carolina. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. And then Texas, you can see again, quite a big state. Uh, you know, southern parts of Texas is all blue, and the northern parts of Texas is all red. So, again, you know, you can kind of nicely draw this map and say 
there are regions of America where you have the uh, two walls is merged into one wall and certain other areas where it's two different uh, walls. Anybody here that actually have two distinct walls for the words? No, you all have it as one single wall, yeah? Okay. So in a map like the one that I just showed you, you can actually draw certain lines to kind of say that, you know, above the certain line, the two walls are merged and below the cer this certain line, the two walls are distinct. Those kind of dialect boundaries are called as isogloss, right? Isogloss. So an isogloss is literally a line on a dialect boundary map that actually gives you a distinction. So there are two distinct uh, kind of, you know, um, pronunciations or words, depending on, you know, what area you're referring to on the dialect boundary map. So an isogloss is that particular line that separates the use of a lexical item or a grammatical construction from another one, okay? a dialect boundary or an isogloss. All right, so now for the fun dialect boundaries and isoglosses, I mean, obviously I'm not, you know, there are no isoglosses drawn on this map, but uh, these are maps that actually show you distinctions between pronunciations of different uh, kind of things. So let's actually start with P-E-C-A-N. I'm not gonna say it because then I'm gonna prime you into saying the word, but how would you pronounce P-E-C-A-N? Pecan. Okay. Pecan. Okay. Pecan. Okay, that's all the same. Anybody else with a different pronunciation? Some people I know say pecan. Uh-huh, yeah. In Wichita or? Yeah. Okay. In this area, my some mom. people do. My mom says pecan instead of my grandpa, but my grandpa's older. He still says like Sunday and um, all that stuff. Okay. Okay. Anybody with a different pronunciation? What do you think majority of America says? What, what do you think this color is? This lightish, reddish? Or what? No, we are in the orange and most of us say Pecan. I'm judging with the orange is pecan. Okay. Okay. So because Kansas is right here. So that, you know, it's the majority. All right. Let's let's see what the red is. Right? That's the red. So that's the majority. Pecan, right? Pecan. And the blue is pecan, right? With a different um ball in the second syllable. Uh, the green, which is all uh, the East Coast, is uh, pecan with the stress on the first syllable. And the yellow, which is uh, kind of concentrated around here, is pecan, right? Pecan. So two different vowels here, pecan and pecan, right? But with the stress on the first syllable and the stress on the second syllable, but with the same vowel, right? Yeah, so majority, so whatever you said, that's what majority of America says. What is your generic term for a sweetened carbonated beverage? Soda. Soda. Can pop. Pop, okay. But I've also heard busy water. Okay, busy water. Uh, my mom is soda pop, so that's kind of older generation might do that. Okay, okay. Anybody else? What is your gender? You can put it in chat if you don't want to speak. To uh, go off, I think it was Kelly who said fizzy water. Instead uh -huh. of calling it fizzy water, we would call it bubble water. Oh, I like that. I like that bubble water. It makes it more, you know, palatable. <laughs> to me, bubble water would be like a um, like sparkling water. Oh, okay. That's There's so many varieties. It's kind of funny. Right, 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 right. No, I see that. I see how that is. So, 
What do you think the blue is? Because we are in the blue right here. As you can see, this is very different from the other map I showed you, right? There's this red, there are deep reds, there's green, there's blue, there's, you know, all kinds of things going around. <laughs> so what do you think is the blue? Soda, pop, fizzy water, bubble water? I'm going to say that the blue is probably pop. OK. I think the blue is soda because Wisconsin and Missouri are, or Minnesota, I mean. Minnesota's up in there. And we know Minnesotans say soda. <laughs> <laughs> We're just I was kind of thinking, oh, go ahead. Trinity, you can go ahead. I was, I was thinking that the red was, the red was soda because uh, the area that I live down in Texas is shaded red and they called it soda. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Let's, let's, for the big reveal. Red is soda and blue is pop. So Trinity, you were absolutely on the right track there. Uh, so majority of cancers says pop, right? Or at least from, you know, whoever was surveyed for this uh, particular uh, map, uh, they say um, pop. And uh, majority of California, the West Coast is all soda. Uh, all, majority of the East Coast is soda. There's this pocket here like Missouri and, is that Indiana? This is Indiana, right? Okay, as you can see, my US geography sucks. Right around St. Louis. Oh, yes. right, right, that's probably what that is. Yeah, huh, that's interesting. That there's, it, it, it's a deep red too, you know? This is probably Chicago or no? Is that further up north? This, this red pocket right here? Yeah, I think that's Chicago. Okay. okay. Okay, so maybe there's a distinction between like a big city versus like smaller places. I don't know. I mean, you know, um, majority of the bigger cities are all um, red, but obviously, you know, Texas has a lot of big cities. Uh, so I'm not sure about that green thing. So green is Coke basically, and yellow is soft drink. And I, I actually don't see any yellow, but you know, yeah, I'm not seeing any yellow in this map. Okay, let's go to the next one. C-A-R-A-M-E-L. Well, here, I always, oh, go ahead. Uh, caramel is how I say it, but. Okay, so two, two syllables, caramel, okay. Kelly? That's how I always, have always said it, caramel, but I've heard people say caramel. Yes, yeah. So. What do you think is the red? Um, I just wanted to say that I looked up what what that other city was. Um, uh -huh. It's Milwaukee. Oh, well. okay, got it. Yeah. And as for caramel, I say caramel, but my stepdad says caramel, yeah. but he says it just to be contrarian. He doesn't <laughs> actually have any any background in anywhere that says caramel. He just says it to be weird. <laughs> He, he, it's a conscious decision. <laughs> Anybody who says caramel, I say caramel, as you can see. Um, but that's from my British English upbringing uh, back in India, uh, because caramel is how they would say it uh, in three syllables. So I've heard in past iterations of teaching linguistics 151 and showing this map to my students, I've heard that there's a distinction between caramel and caramel with different meanings. So depending on what you're referring to, right? So, you know, with respect to frosting on cakes or cookies, there's a different pronunciation uh, versus like the candy that you would eat. And yeah, so, you know, again, um, lots of different ways of saying um, the word with different meaning associations. What do you think is the red? Do you think red is two syllables or three syllables? That seems to be the majority of America, so. I would say the majority says caramel. Caramel, all right. That's right. Uh, red is caramel, so that's two syllables. Uh, the blue is 
caramel. And as you can see, it's majority of the East uh, Coast, which is where, you know, the British landed and colonization, you know, um, happened first. So they still have that British kind of pronunciation, caramel. Uh, green is, I use both interchangeably. And again, I cannot see any green. Um, maybe there are some pockets somewhere, but I do not see them. And yellow is, I use both forms, but the two have different meanings. And that's kind of what, you know, some of my students in the past have said, uh, that the they, majority of them say caramel, but they use caramel in a very kind of, one is soft and sticky and gooey, and the other one is hard or something like that. What do you call the miniature lobster that one finds in lakes and streams, for example, a crustacean of the family Astacidae? A crawdad. Crawdad? Okay, crawdad. That's what I thought too, crawdad. Okay. Anybody else? I think I, think I say crawdad, but I've heard crayfish more. In Wichita or in general? In, in general. I don't know if I've ever heard anyone refer to them ever in Wichita. <laughs> Just what I I've say crayfish. This is crayfish. I say crayfish. Um, but my family is from the East Coast. And I think obviously you see more of them like out there in the mountains and stuff, like in creeks and things. So when we go out there, I think that's where I got the pronunciation crayfish. Okay. Okay, crayfish, anybody else? I've also heard crawfish instead of like crayfish, uh -huh. um, but I personally use crawdad. Okay. But I think that's the distinction between like, you don't say like a crawdad broil, you would say a crawfish or crayfish broil. So I think like if you're eating it, it's different because like a crawdad to me feels like a bug. I know it's not a bug, but it's like a water bug, but <laughs> different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you think the green is? I mean, we are in the green. Um, you know, pretty strong green compared to other parts of the green. Um, what do you think that is? Is that crawdad or crayfish? Just based on how I've heard it growing up here, I would assume that it's crawdad. Okay. And based off of what um, I, the other person said from the East Coast saying crayfish. Uh-huh. The red might be crayfish then. Okay, let's see. That, so, so the green is crayfish. Oh wait, so the green is crawdad. So that was right. So green is crawdad. The blue is crayfish. So that's, uh, you know, again, on the north. And the red is crawfish. Uh, so that's all of Texas in southern uh, US, Louisiana and parts of Florida and all that. And yellow is, I have no word for this critter. I, I belong in that yellow category because I didn't grow up here. So I have absolutely no word for that. I believe you when you say it's crawdad or crayfish or crawfish. But if you ask me, I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's just a critter, exactly. Um, so that, you know, that I think again is a map that has a lot of variations depending on where you grew up and, you know, whether you grew up seeing the critter, right? Um, all right. M A Y O N N A I S E. I just realized that I pronounced this completely not how it's spelled. And that probably most of us too. I'm guessing mo most of you guys pronounce the same as me. Mayonnaise. Yes. Mayonnaise. <laughs> so is that two syllables? Okay. Mayonnaise. Okay. I, I used to pronounce it or I used to pronounce it mayonnaise, but now I pronounce it mayonnaise. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? I have a three syllable pronunciation for that, you know, representative of the spelling of the word mayonnaise, right? Uh, yeah, I would never say that with two syllables, but again, I didn't grow up here. So anybody else? Olivia is trying really hard to, you know, <laughs> decide on the pronunciation. 
I usually just say mayo to avoid the whole confusion, sure. but I think I would probably say mayonnaise. Like, I feel like it's kind of in between, like, it's not as short as mayonnaise, but it's not mayonnaise. It's like mayonnaise. Sure. So sure. I don't know. Sure. Okay. You can see Kansas is kind of divided. So we, you know, we're kind of in the, the reddish bluish area. So um, depending, I think Wichita is in the blue, um, you know. Um, so what do you think that is? What do, what do you think? Is it two syllable, three syllable, or just mayo? <laughs> My guess would be the blue is two syllables because it looks like a lot of Southern states uh -huh. say, or are blue. And sometimes I think a lot of the Southern accents will kind of cut out some of the syllables and words. Sure. Let's test that hypothesis. The red is with three syllables, so mayonnaise, like how I would say it, and the blue is with the the way that Landon said it, right? The two syllables, mayonnaise. <laughs> uh, green is when I use both interchangeably, and the yellow is other, like how Olivia said, right? I say mayo just to avoid that entire um, pronunciation. Okay. G R O C E R Y. This, I think, you know, every time I teach this in 151, I get one answer. I do not get any variation. Oh, but Landon is now <laughs> not so sure anymore. I say it as like an S H. Yeah. Grocery. Grocery. Yeah. That, that's that what grocery. Is that what you, you would say as well, Landon, Olivia? Yeah, that's what I hear every single time I teach Linguistics 151, all my students, groceries. And I'm like, no, it's groceries. <laughs> that, that, you know, when I moved from Los Angeles, I did my PhD in um, LA. Uh, they say groceries there all the time. And, you know, I came here and then I heard somebody say to me, are you going to get groceries? And I'm like, what? What am I going to get? I had never heard that before. It's not common in Los Angeles, as you can see from the map, right? Um, and it's obviously not common in India as well. So I was completely blindsided when I moved uh, to Wichita and when somebody said groceries for the first time. But, you know, I, I think it's pretty robust all across Kansas. All that blue is groceries, as in like shocked with the sh, and the red is where you would see the s. So uh, groceries, as in sock. And again, British says groceries, and that's why majority of the East Coast still says grocery. And then, you know, the more we move to the interior of the country, it started moving into the sir to the sh um, kind of pronunciation. So, do you say frosting or icing for the sweet spread one puts on a cake? I say both because at least in my family, there's a difference. Frosting is like birthday cake frosting. It's like buttercream or cream cheese. Sure. And icing is like powdered sugar and milk. Like it's a very runny, uh, runny sweet um, glaze that you put over things. Okay, so you have a different meaning for both. I, I agree. I think I think I pretty much use them the same way as she. That's the same for me and my family. Okay, so two different meanings for the, the words, right? Depending on what you use. Okay. Red is all frosting. Um, blue is both. And again, I think Wichita is in that reddish bluish area. So, you know, it kind of goes with what you are all saying. Green is icing is thinner than frosting. White and or made of powdered sugar and milk or lemon juice. And yellow is all just icing. So again, a lot of variation across the United States with respect to something as simple as frosting or icing, right? Um, okay. Um, going back to that one real quick, I would, do you think there's a difference? Like if you have a frosted cookie, that means there's icing on it. So, <laughs> well, I see. But so, right, but this is not a cookie, this is a cake, okay? but. Yeah, so this is a very specific oh, okay. thing that does not say cookie, but I, I see where that is coming from. A frosted cookie has icing on it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I see that. 
Yes, but like I said, this this question is only about cake, so we will not worry about cookies. <laughs> what do you call a drive-through liquor store? Again, to people who are above twenty-one in the class. I don't think we have drive-through liquor stores here. Okay. Yeah, we do. Yeah, oh, we okay. do have I some. Have, I think <laughs> all of them are at this point. Spangles. <laughs> I mean, is that real alcohol? Because like I can't really tell. Um, I only go to Spangles for breakfast, so I wouldn't know. <laughs> it's probably very little alcohol, so they can capitalize on. All right, and a lot of ice. Yeah, I I just refer to a drive-through liquor store as a drive-through liquor store. Okay, so pretty verbatim right? Uh, drive through liquor store. Okay. Let's see. I have never heard of such a thing, like all the red uh, um, color. Uh, blue is we have these in my area, but we have no special term for them. So I think Kansas is a little bit of both. I've never heard of such a thing where it says we have these in my area, but the term that people call a drive through liquor store is a brew through. Like a drive through, a brew through. <laughs> That's the term. Uh, but again, very few yellow color on here uh, and green is other. Okay. The last one. Uh, oh, wait, I, I cannot. Oh, okay. Wait, I'm trying to. What do you call the little gray creature that looks like an insect, but is actually a crustacean that rolls up into a ball when you touch it? A roly poly. Like a roly poly? Roly poly. Roly poly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a roly poly, I think pretty robust, red, deep red. Kansas is all roly poly. Uh, there's also pill bug, potato bug, and I have no idea what that creature is. So you, you've never heard of potato bug? Nope. Okay. All I the um, I I've heard of know. a I've heard of a potato bug, but it's referring to in this area anyway. It refers to a different kind of bug. Oh, okay. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I happen to know that there's actually two creatures that are that I would call roly polies that okay. are unrelated or near they're both like arthropods, but there's a crustacean uh -huh. roly poly and which sometimes is called a sow bug. Okay. Um, as a more technical term. And then there's a millipede that is a yeah. roly poly, a pill millipede. Oh, I've never heard of millipede as a roly poly. Why why yeah. would you call there's, a there is a species of millipede that's very, it's very short like that. Uh, and it looks pretty much the same as a, as a, the crustacean one. They've both evolved like very, very um, convergent evolution such that oh, I cannot really work. <laughs> Interesting. But I don't remember where. None of you say pillbug? Nope. Not really. Okay. Okay. All right. So. Now that we've had fun with the uh, maps, let's switch to the activity. And this is nothing to do with maps. Uh, like I said, maps are interesting. It's fun. It gets you talking. I'm going to show you a video now and goes back to our topic about language variation and language and dialect. And I want you, before you watch the video, um, answer these following questions for yourself. And then we'll watch the video and then we'll, you know, talk, um, uh, discuss more about this. Do you ever feel that you have to change the way you speak? Why or why not, right? So just um, think for yourself whether you have to change the way you speak ever. When you change your speech, is it mostly conscious or unconscious? Uh, that is, do you have to think about it or does it happen naturally? And I want you to list five situations where you're likely to change your speech. If you say yes, rank these five situations from one to five, with one being the situation where you have to be the most careful about the way you speak, and five being the situation where you can be the most casual. Okay. I have a quick question. Yes. Is this in reference to only pronunciation or like lexical items? Lexical items and pronunciations both. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it could be registers and not just dialects, right? Um, different registers of speech, if you will. Let me know when I can move ahead and go to the video, but 
you don't need to write it up. Just you know, think for yourself. I posted. I posted a, a screen grab of that in the groupie. Oh, of course. Thank you, Landon. Okay, um, let us watch the video. Count this verbo. Oh, man. Hi, they're your cousins. Look at me. We can Language is an important part of all social and cultural groups, but it seems to have a special place in the African American experience. We have come through racial discrimination. We've come through poverty. We've come through the floods. We've come through a whole lot. But you know what, Princeville? You're still standing. Even inside the African American community, when you go from region to region, there are um, really different voices and sounds. Guy in front of the White House there, mm -hmm. in the back of that woods, way back there. It's deep out there. Which they had logged some of it out, but um, back on the woods where we hunt bears. But uh, usually we and um, me and dog go out there and move the field paths so they can see them real good. Um, so it's five hundred dollars just to go, and five hundred dollars to kill one. So it's very expensive for shooting bears. We'll see out there and show them we built. Uh, on we're back through. Let's stream up through this. You can tell the difference between. Um, an African American who lives in the Northeast because they say scrape, which is not something you'd hear in Durham or you'd hear in Winston Salem or you'd hear in Fayetteville. But if you hear scrape or scrape, you know exactly where they came from. Inside the African American community, too, there is a love of language, there's a love of listening to different styles of language. It's the music and the poetry of the language, no matter which vocabulary set you're using. Child, because I talk just like the people uh, at the foot of the Blue Ridge Mountain uh, with that uh, kind of twang and that kind of thing. And so that was just a part of me. I have noticed this. Every click has their own lingo. Every click. It can change from a click standpoint to a state standpoint to a region standpoint. You see what I'm saying? We might say stuff in North Carolina that people in Georgia might not say, but there may there may be things that people in North Carolina and South Carolina and Georgia would say all together. You see what I'm saying? I've been told I've talked like I'm from the city. I've been told I talk like I'm from the okay. country. I just talk like I talk. I am who I am. Oh, yeah. and you belong, can thrill me like you do, and fill my heart with love for only you. Dialect suggested at times a worldview that I was always interested in. Uh, there's a form in black dialect, the B form. Uh, I'd be doing X, Y, and Z, or I'd be going, or that particular issue, which I always thought was interesting, but maybe very descriptive of being in process, which is somehow not expressed in the regular language pattern. It's a whole bunch of people in New York that we know from down here, and the way they be talking and stuff. The way they be talking and stuff, they like you can't have to understand them. They have to stutter because they don't know like our language. And that girl over there. Yeah. I know in my church, um, there's a lot of bending of the rules, you know, i.e. using of language, but it's the use of language in a way to continue to communicate ideas. And and and, and oftentimes it's not just ideas, it's emotion. Oh, oh. Only you.
You get folks from upstate, you get folks from down south, so, so you get a different variety of voices here. But that once you get to know the heart and the spirit of folks, we're all one big family. You always want to be connected with a group and making sure that you're continuing to to be to have that touchstone of this is you know this is where you came from and this is how the folk, this is how the people talk where you come from, it's really important to not lose that. You have to be able to relate to your peers and, and you know, you know, you got to, yo, what up, yo, what up, what's going on, such and such, blah, 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 you, this the, it's our lingo, man. What's cracking me, what's up, what's up, me, For shizzle hey. me, for shizzle me, yeah. Okay. And, like, when most people say, like, most people say, I can't explain. You explain it. If, if Fonte comes over and he plays, you know, plays our daughter, he's like, "Say word up." He's like, "She's like, word up." You know, you know, it's it's just like in the sixties. If you got right on, yeah, right on, and peace, and, and you know, and all of that, it's it's it's, it's about the same thing. So it's, it's a part of our life. It's like it's a part of their lives, I guess. And we use that term because that's like a a sense of family. You know what I'm saying? It's like you know that that's what determines the line you know what i'm saying if we're real close then we we're at liberty to talk like that because we understand each other where if you're outside and i don't really know you and you know it's like hey how you doing yeah it's just like oh hi how you doing man you know until i get that vibe that you lose then it's yeah well, what's up you know what i mean but until it gets to that point then you kind of just do that you know what i mean to kind of draw that line so the more the more closer you feel to somebody then you loosen up and the language plays a big part in that i've heard every Walk of life, say I'm chilling, I'm cooling. What up, bro? What up, man? All of that is is hip hop music, which is the extension of of, of '70s soul music, which comes off '60s Motown music. I mean, it carries on, it carries on. So with hip hop, I don't know where I don't know where our generation would be as far as the way we speak and everything with our hip hop music. Every generation has to identify itself and create its own language. They've negotiated a new space. They will quote it, and yes, I'm overloaded with rhymes, verse, punchlines, similes, and metaphors. For better or worse, I crush any competitors. Verse, and I keep spitting for PBS and Fonte off of the top, no second guessing. Cause I'm coming through with the right plan. And yes, in hip hop, we do have friends. And yes, he is a white man. His name is Joe Scudder, and he freestyle too. And I'm about to show you just how we do. I'm spitting with my cap on, and I'm gonna pass it to the left of Scudder so he can get his rap on. I clap on. Yo, I'm back on. Gonna grind again. Stay reminding them we in the front where the line begin. You in the back where the line go end. I think it's one of the many markers that people use to decide whether you're in the in group or the out group. And that's one of the reasons for kind of mimicking the speech around of people who you're around, or consciously deciding not to. And we were just talking about it on the way here, how people try to express themselves. Well, you know, you don't need to express yourself so much that when you get out in society, you can't function. Because when you go for a job interview and the person sitting behind the desk, you know, they may not want to hear that. Particularly in the African-American community, there is this idea that, yes, you know, you can speak in a much more relaxed, intimate black speech in certain spaces. And then in other spaces, you have to speak a much more common English. And for some people, there's an internal struggle about should you really do that? Should you really be trying to talk like white folk? Or should you always, all the time, no matter what setting you are in, speak the same way? Speak the same way your mama taught you to speak. It all depends on uh, what environment you're in, expectations of other people, like what they think they need to hear from you. All of these are the kinds of things that you encounter when you're dealing with communication. All right, so, so now that you watched the video, um, let me pull back the questions. Um, okay, so, so I asked you before we watched the video to answer these questions. And now I want you to, you know, think back about the video that you just saw and see 
could you hear differences in the speech of individuals in different situations? Because we heard from a lot of different people, different you know, age groups, different gender. Are these African-Americans aware uh, of the way that they change their speech or not? And why do you think that they feel as though they must change their speech in different situations? So compared to your own experience of, you know, what I asked you to reflect before you watch the video. Anybody? Kelly? Um, I could hear the differences in the speech um, in that video. And from my experience and understanding, most African-Americans are aware of the fact um, they like code switch, depending on what setting they're in. Um, my boyfriend is African American, and he's a high school principal. And so in that context, he speaks, I notice that he speaks very standard English. Right. Um, but when he's with his family, um, or just hanging out with friends, um, then he speaks more of his, his natural way mm -hmm. as opposed to the more standard English. Do you think that's a conscious decision, Kelly, or an unconscious decision? I think it's a conscious decision. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? who wants to give me some thoughts about, you know, I mean, I'm trying to make you think about what we talked about with the sociopolitical. Um, you yeah, know. I'd like to make a point. Um, so for African-Americans, my stepdad's from Kenya, so he's African-American. He's not really aware of his accent and neither are anyone else here in the African community, mm -hmm. but like black people, um, what is it, B-E-B? is black English vernacular. And yeah. so like that's separate. And it seems that like younger children mm -hmm. don't realize it at all. Um, but most adults, you can see like you're on the phone voice, you know, when you're on the phone with someone versus how you talk to your kids and then, you know, at work and stuff. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? The point that, you know, I was trying to drive home is um, there are a lot of studies and, you know, I'm not going to talk about the studies in detail, but uh, there are a lot of studies that have shown uh, that the same person, like, you know, suppose I'm African-American and I can code switch to use the term Kelly um, mentioned to switch between African-American vernacular English and standard English. There have been a lot of studies that show that, you know, suppose you want housing and I pick up the phone and I talk to a real estate person in African-American vernacular English versus standard English, the results are so different. Like there are so many studies that have shown that if I pick up the phone and speak in Ave, they might be like, oh no, the house is gone. It's not available. It's off market. Somebody bought it. It's under contract. And then, you know, minutes later, I pick up the phone and I talk in standard English. They say, oh yeah, of course, when do you want to come and see it? Right. So just the, the repercussions of language and dialect is, is so profound in today's society, right? I mean, it's that, that's why I kind of, you know, asked you to kind of reflect for yourself, whether you feel that you have to change the way you speak. How many of you feel that you change the way you speak um, in any situation? I do. Some of you do. Yeah. But, you know, what kind of situations are these? Is it different from what we heard in the video or, you know? Well, for me, like if I'm at church or with my family, my family is very religious. Mm -hmm. My mother's a minister. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm with my family or at church, obviously I'm not going to use any type of um, swear word. Sure. But natural, I mean, in my normal day-to-day -day type speech patterns, I do swear sometimes, but I have to be very careful to not do that when I'm in certain 
places. Right, right. So that's a conscious decision again that you're taking. Anybody else? Anybody else who feels that you have to change? Olivia, I mean, because you said that you worked in a restaurant, do you think you speak differently in a restaurant versus your normal speech pattern? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't work in a restaurant anymore, but there was definitely like, I think maybe it was more the tone of how you speak. Like it was more like, oh, bubbly, how are you? What can I do for you? Um, and I don't, I mean, I wasn't hugely different between like my normal conversation, but it was more like, okay, I'm going to be cheery so that you feel comfortable. I don't know. But it honestly, for me, that just really depended on the customer and like how they approached kind of, because it's like, if it was like a, someone who looked like they were having a bad day, I wouldn't be like, oh my gosh, how are you? Whatever. But then if it was like someone who came at, with that level of um, energy, then I might. But I would say like the biggest difference of the way I change how I speak is like, if I'm, um, if I'm meeting someone new, I'm not gonna talk to them the same way I talk to my friends, right. um, because that would just be kind of off-putting. Um, and then when I'm at work, like I work as a tutor. So it's like, there's, um, when I'm talking to my boss, it's going to be different than when I'm talking to the kids, but it's not so different that I feel like I'm faking one over the other. Sure. Like it's still me and it's still how I talk. It's just different. Sure. Yeah. We're out of time. So this is the, the last thought that I'm going to leave you with today, that the dialect of language you speak is part of your privilege, right? I mean, you know, we talk about privilege in a lot of different ways, but, you know, we, we don't, I think we don't often talk about language as part of that privilege, but it is, right? And I think that's one of the things that, you know, uh, I was trying to drive home with the video that you just saw. So that's the last thought that I'm going to leave you with. I will see you all on Tuesday and we will watch the documentary, The Linguist together. Have a good weekend. Bye. Okay.